Welcome back to the Pair Like a Pro podcast. This week on the show, we have Darren Burgess, the high performance manager of the Melbourne Football Club. Prior to working at Melbourne, Darren was the director of performance at the Arsenal Football Club, high performance manager at Port Adelaide Football Club, head of conditioning at the Liverpool and head of fitness at the Football Federation of Australia. Before we start episode 48, the Prepare Like a Pro podcast mission is to empower as many athletes and staff as possible by providing practical knowledge from some of the industry's most inspiring individuals and to strengthen the AFL community. If you like the show, please show your support by following us on Instagram and by subscribing to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Thanks for jumping on, guys. Remember to, if you have any questions for Darren, hit the question button at the bottom of your screen where you can post through some questions that we'll get to at a later time. I'm just going to send, bear with me, I'll just send my invite over to Darren to join us. G'day, Darren. G'day, Jack. How are you, mate? Going well, mate. Thanks for jumping on. Fantastic. We'll, we'll dive straight in, mate. Let's uh, start at the very beginning. At what age did you realize you had a passion for working in elite sport? Um, I think, um, like most kids, you just play a lot of sport growing up and uh, it wasn't quite good enough. Uh, so I thought the next best thing, uh, you know, in terms of making it in sport, uh, would be to try and work in sport somehow. So, um, yeah, this is this is what I decided to do. There weren't too many people uh, doing this type of degree when, when I was going through it. So uh, it was a bit unique and much to the frustration of my parents um, yeah. because they didn't see many jobs there. My sister was a teacher. My brother was an accountant. So... Uh, you know, there's plenty of jobs there. So, um, but yeah, here I am. Yeah, it worked out. It was a good, good decision. Uh, were there it's people, an enjoyable one. Were there, so you mentioned it, it wasn't a common um, career choice at the time. Uh, did you know of S and C's when you chose to do the degree? Did someone guide you to that course, or was it purely on your instinct that you decided no, to study? No, knew of no one. I think the course was only around for maybe a year and a half two years before yeah, I went there. Um, and I, I enrolled, uh, it was Bachelor of Exercise Science at Uni New South Wales. I enrolled in order to to a, to a be a PE teacher. That was my, I thought, okay, I'll do three years of this degree and then do a dip ed. And so, yeah, I think we were maybe the second or third cohort to go through it. Okay. Yeah, I remember speaking to a couple of football coaches where they used to call the, the fitness guys the phys edders. Yeah, a lot of them came yeah, from PE. <laughs> yeah, so, that's uh, us. I think um, famously, uh, yeah, the previous CEO of the AFL called us all phys editors, which um, yeah wasn't uh, Mr. Demetrio, which wait, but it stuck. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Well, fair t- I, I, honestly, well, the so- titles thing gets a bit gets a, people get a bit excited about the titles thing, but I don't really care. Like, we know what job we do, and like, that's fine. Absolutely. And did you have some strong influences once you got once you did the degree and, and started working in the field? Who, who have some people that have helped you along your journey? Yeah, probably my parents um, mostly helped me along uh, because there wasn't any necessarily uh, people going through at the same – other than people going through at the same time, there wasn't anybody in the field that I sort of aspired to be because there wasn't much of a field, which is showing my age a little bit. Um, early on um, – a gentleman by the name of John Marsden from the Sydney Academy of Sport. He was sort of my first boss, I guess, in this field. And there were some pioneers before me, guys like Anthony Creer, who were in the Australian soccer ruse job and those sorts of things uh, that, that that were probably my most – that's what they're the jobs that I wanted anyway, whether those people inspired me or not, but that's kind of what I, what I wanted to do. Uh, I was reasonably obsessed with soccer uh, – and, and getting into soccer at that stage um, in terms of fitness in soccer. So, um, yeah, anybody in that sort of space, um, you yeah, I was, know, I was pretty keen on emulating. I sent, uh, I've told this story before, but I sent 93 uh, letters, handwritten letters to uh, Premier League, uh, first division, it wasn't Premier League at the time, but first to fourth division clubs in England. Uh, I got three back, three rejections back and 88 uh, what it, 89, 90, couldn't be bothered replying. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to be. Um, so, yeah. 
And what did the role look like at, at those Division One clubs? Is it full time then, part time? I, I had a, I had no idea. Honestly, I had no idea who was in there. There wasn't like you couldn't Google it or anything like that. I, I yeah. um, just sent a letter saying, listen, if there's a fitness job there, I'm your guy. Even though I was sort of second year at uni and um, just I had no no idea what I was doing really, but uh, probably. I worked in Pizza Hut and did some personal training, and that probably paid for the stamps that I had to <laughs> had to buy to get overseas. Yeah, to send my uh, fantastic. Overseas. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure that would resonate with a lot of uh, developing SNCs listening in. That you, you know, um, putting yourself out there uh, is really important, but also having that being you got to make an income, don't you, while you're studying. So, well, what were you? What did you mention there? Personal training and and Pizza Hut was what you yeah, had you paid your way. Did Pizza Hut. Um, yeah, I delivered pizzas. Worked in a um, in a gym in Bankstown in Sydney, um, basically telling the clients how to cycle their steroids, um, uh, and because <laughs> uh, that, that was the sort of gym it was. Um, uh, yeah, and, and personal training, which was a I was a bit of a failure at, but um, I enjoyed it because it was outdoors and early mornings, late afternoons. But it just it used to really sort of, uh, if I can say, shit me when. Um, when people didn't turn up, you know, if it was raining, they wouldn't turn up or if they'd had a late night, they wouldn't turn up. And I just thought, no, this is not for me. I don't have the patience um, for people who aren't committed. Yep. And what was your first role in sport? Uh, my first role, I, I, I did my honours at Uni New South Wales and, and got a um, conference and got really lucky and uh, got asked to be a uh, sort of third string fitness coach for the Sydney Swans. Uh, and at the same time, um, I was helping coach uh, Waverley Cricket Club and uh, Greg just came on board, ex-test cricketer for those folk in the, <laughs> who were listening in. Um, and he said, yeah, can you, can you be the fitness coach because I'm going to captain coach? And I said, yep, no problem. Um, so that, that sort of combination. Uh, so the Swans for sort of 20 hours a week. And, um, and basically my job was to run around Sydney, find a place for them to run, go on long runs across you know, Cronulla Beach and up around DY because most of the Swans players didn't come from Sydney. So, um, yeah, that, that was my first job really to look after the rehab people and um, every Saturday morning we'd get, take a long run through the city. Yeah, okay. And, and how many years did you do that for before progressing on to your next role? Yeah, I was with the Swans for four years um, in, in various roles. Um, then a full-time job came up with them and, and I got overlooked for it. Um, which was fair enough. Um, and from there, I went uh, and did some lecturing at Australian Catholic University. Um, that was full time. And while I did that, uh, I got probably what, you know one of my most influential early jobs with Paramount Power in the old National Soccer League in the last couple of years in the National Soccer League. And the coach hired yep. me and then went to Greece for basically the 12 weeks of the preseason literally hired me and said, by the way, I'm going to Greece, you've got the preseason. So it was myself and Manfred Schaefer, who was a very old um, ex-legend of Australian football. I literally had to organise everything and we had a full-time kit man and that was it. And we had these professional players and um, it was well and truly thrown in the deep end, but um, absolutely loved it, learnt so much and had, had some brilliant players and had a ball. Had an absolute ball. It was hard because I was driving from North Sydney to Parramatta and, um, I, yeah, it was tough. Lived in Cronulla, so I did the full sort of triangle around. But um, absolutely loved, loved it. You mentioned there was, there was a fair bit of travel involved and there wasn't a lot of support in the role. So, lot, No, no support. Um, uh, yeah, heaps of travel, no support. And um, But I absolutely loved it. I learned so much because I was designing the skill components of training, the fitness components, doing all the video analysis. I'd be at home in front of the VCR, just taking notes. And, um, yeah, I used a um, software called Track Performance, which was so horribly um, inaccurate, but um, that was all that was around at the time. And, yeah, had an absolute ball. Loved it. And worked with some, some you know, some soccerers and some great players. It was great. Yeah, and, and was it the, the component of the fact that you didn't have a lot of support that you sort of thrived in that environment where you could be the generalist and, and it was all put on you to, to manage all these different roles? Was that something that you, that you already knew about yourself until before that role or did it something you sort of discovered no, during that I growth? Did, uh, absolutely. 
Yeah, it's a good question, Jack. I, I absolutely just I didn't know. Um, and it was it was literally a necessity because there was no one else around. Like you'd look around and go, right, who can take this this session? And the, I was it. And these yeah, were, it. The, they were the only professional players in the country at the time and um, organising pre-season friendlies in North Queensland and camps in Gold Coast and, you know, just uh, – and then, okay, what, what are we doing? Urjo, what are we doing? And there's, a, you know, Simon Colosimo and Ante Milosic and Fernando Reck and – Super Australian talent, and I'm saying, all right, well, we're going to play four four two today, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. It was, yeah, it was good fun, but hard work. But uh, I probably learnt the most in that job. Yeah, yeah, and and how did you how did you come up with the drills, and how did how would you plan uh, the skills component to it, and then even also the video analysis? Like, did you have experience <laughs> in, in that uh, side? Um, uh, do you know what? I back in those days, I would order a whole lot of DVDs and um, books, mainly from the US, on on football soccer drills. Um, like every single book that came out on top drill, you know, the Ajax Academy and things like that. And, and I would just use those, and I would just pour through these books and um, and DVDs. Uh, and every day, you check the mail for a new book to come in to try and get some new ideas and. Um, because this is 2002, 2001-2002, before all the, that sort of information was, excuse me, so readily available in the, on the internet. So um, that was the and main so you, way that I did it. And you were doing the the, the drills f- from tactical sort of skill development point of view, opposed to sort of conditioning. Yeah. 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 Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to do trying to do both. Yeah. Uh, and how do you feel like that shaped you as you? into your career now like that that role oh, i think um it made me appreciate work ethic and and the work that goes into that sort of a role and it also forced me to be a good communicator with players develop good relationships with players um uh, it forced me to uh sort of uh, get the importance of players trusting you because these these guys were trusting me with their careers, you know they were some of them were were at the end of it, but a lot of them were at the beginning of their um, you know their European careers, potential European careers and things like that. so it really um, made me appreciate uh, like I said a work ethic and be the complete picture rather than just okay, I'm going to take the warm up and the running at the end um, yeah. but this sort of taught me how to build a session, build a plan, build a week, build a and, you know, you didn't do it on Excel. I had a Mac Classic at the time. that I just wrote notes on whatever word processing program was on there at the time. So, um, uh, yeah, and that, that's – and I just went back to the, the same notes the next year. So even though the coach kind of threw me in the deep end, it was – yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like um, you learned some huge lessons that can take – a long time to, to sort of gain, you know, both in yourself with self awareness, but also what's effective and what's the what's really important in terms of performance. Yeah, and, and uh, I agree. Um, I think had I just just been the fitness coach or just done the warm ups, uh, um, you take a whole lot longer to develop those, um, you know, to develop those relationships and those skills. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think um, they used to call it. Uh, in the initial stage, the Parramatta Power Athletics Club, and um, uh, yeah. because a lot of my drills were athletics based, and then I just went, no, this isn't working. I, I need to, I need to bring the ball in, and I need to to be more football savvy, and um, yeah, and so it was a really good crash crash course. So, do you think for for listening, developing S and Cs would is it coaching a junior team? Is it you know? cutting your teeth by being the skills coach for some yes, form of yes, Jack, yes, absolutely. I'm interrupting you because I'm really passionate about it, mate. Um, you have to go and coach your own team. You just have to. And when I say coach, I mean if you can coach them from a, a skills point of view or go and be the fitness coach for your local team and you won't get any money, you might get a tracksuit, but you just get these life lessons and skill lessons, um, you know, coaching skill, coaching nuance lessons that, you know, I fear for people who do their internship at an AFL club or an NRL club and then only ever want a job in that league, at that club, in their local professional club. Um, 
you just won't be as good, in my opinion, won't be as good a practitioner um, if you don't get those life lessons of standing up in front of um, men, women, boys, girls, and uh, and just say, right, here's what we're going to do. Today. You know what, it's raining. I'm going to have to change it. You know what, um, it's too windy. I can't do that um, soccer volleyball drill because the ball's flying all over this. Um, you know what, I read about this drill that Chelsea do, but the Paramount of Power don't have the skill to do it because the ball keeps going mm. out. So what am I going to do? You know, just those little things that you wouldn't you wouldn't get unless you, you, you sat in front of your own group. Yeah, great. That's such a powerful message. And um, not only like what, what you mentioned, the, the story before where you were at Sydney Swans, so that the foot was in the door there four years full, you know, part-time. You'd imagine, oh, yep, here I go. I'm going to get my full-time contract. But um, you're actually told no uh, and then, you know, move on to the next one. So, uh, yeah, it's not like if you get an internship at a footy club, it means that a full-time job's a matter of time. Um, it's got to be no, the right time for you and the right time for the club. Until, yeah, I didn't get my first full-time job till I was 29, I reckon, and uh, I was into about a dozen jobs that I'd applied for um, and didn't get a different different jobs, different roles, schools, um, you know, corporate organisations doing health and wellness, those sorts of things just got continually turned down. And what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the, in the industry in the last sort of 20 years? I think the specialist positions um, are, are, are some real changes. Um, you know, when you have a specialist nutritionist, specialist um, strength coach, specialist power, specialist acceleration, sprint coach, those sorts of things, they certainly weren't. My first full-time job was, was um, with Port Adelaide in end of 2004, and um, it was myself and a strength coach dealing with 45 players and um yeah now uh when i left port in 2017 um we had an amazing uh, and they still have um an amazing high performance team and there was probably you know 10 full-time members um dealing with the same number of athletes in the same competition more or less so that just shows you the the growth of the specialists um, the athletes know a lot more um the, the players that i work with know a lot more and a lot more curious. So that's uh, it's important that you're on top of your game and on top of knowledge. Um, almost daily, a player will come in and say, "I read this, I, I heard this, um, I saw that." I think I've just seen a few of them float up on this um, on this uh, live feed. So uh, they'll no doubt tomorrow um, at work. So it, yeah, they they know a lot more. So you've got to be on your game. Coaches know a lot more. Um, so yeah, you just have to be well researched, and and um, and then the the final thing is well, probably the the two last things. Uh, technology has improved, um, and it's massively influential on in what we do, uh, whether that's monitoring players on the field, in the gym, while they're sleeping, while they're resting. Um, we have access to a lot more information, um, and the final thing is a mental game. That's uh, probably the big thing that I've learnt the most about in the last five or six years. Um, and I've actively tried to research on the influence of, um, yeah, the brain on performance. And why the last sort of five or six years, is it, was there a trend that you started to see or is that an area that you see competitive, like you can get a competitive edge in that space? Uh, yeah, both. Um, certainly the the trend, um, when I joined, I was lucky enough to get the Socceroos job in sort of 2007, late 2007, um, and then worked with them all the way through the World Cup in South Africa, which was, was probably the highlight of my career so far. Those players who were able to travel from Europe to Australia, play on a Saturday um, for Everton, say Tim Cahill or Lucas Neal, and then come and play for Australia on a Wednesday night and then go back and play for Everton. And even though what I was reading in research was, no, you can't do that, you need four days to acclimatise, you need four nights sleep to get into time zones and, and I thought now these guys love playing for their country they want to play for their country and I'd get all the physical data and it'd be the same in all three games and I'd just think holy hell there's something else going on here um, and it mm. was just that mental ability to push through um, what was happening physically um, and what their body was being put through so that sort of woke me up to the fact that do you know what there's, um, there's a few more things than your ability to do a 3K or an MAS program or, or whatever it might be. And what what areas of, of um, whether it be like mental skills 
um, or, or games or, or activities that are, are elite athletes doing that for those that are not are aware, like what's the sort of regime? Is it, like you said, curiosity, how important is that in terms of the mental game and, and what are some things that athletes are doing nowadays to, to improve in this area? Uh, certainly the um, sports psychologists that we're fortunate enough to work with now are far more skilled at this than I am. So I'm, I'm talking about, a, you know, I'm a relative outsider. So they certainly have access to performance psychology and performance psychiatry. And I've been lucky enough to work with two on the planet in this space and learn so much from. Um, so I think that it'd be sort of remiss of me not to say that their, their access to more professional services um, the things that um, we try and do is just vary things up to um, keep things fresh, keep things surprising for them because the games that I'm, I've mainly, which is soccer and AFL, are constantly changing, constantly, you know, they're dynamic sports. So um, you cannot possibly um, succeed if you're not prepared for a little bit of uncomfortableness and unpredictability. So... Um, in order to mentally prepare for that, um, we try and make training that way as much as possible. And that's something that I've over a long period of time. So that would, yeah, if you have a, let's say, a meeting for the main training session, could there be you and the, and the head coach sort of, sp- you know, sort of spring something on the playing group, that the, the drill changes or... Absolutely. Doing an yep, and absolutely. Then- um, never tell them how many, you know, running sets they're doing and just just things like that. And we change things all the time, particularly in pre-season. Um, in season, I think it's important players know what's what's coming and when, but pre-season um, there wouldn't be a sort of a day or a week, certainly not a week go by where we wouldn't change something up. Yeah, it can be pretty frustrating for players and staff, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it's for the greater good, hopefully. Yeah, it's... That makes a lot of sense. Like you said, it's such a dynamic game, so to be able to think quick on your feet and, and adjust. So that won't just be conditioning. It's also skills. The tactical side of things will come in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the coaches will do things from, you know, be shocking umpires or referees um, to challenge yeah. them mentally in that space. How do you handle it when you're, you know, when you're um, on the wrong end of umpiring calls, which we all have been from time. Um, it will be d- literally just changing the game, changing the rules. So in, in football sense, you know, it might be two touch to one touch to, you know, just constantly changing. You back chatted, you go on a 10 minute run. Um, so your team's got to play with nine men, um, or women in that time, you know, just, just different things like that. Even if the player didn't back chat, no, nope, you're off, you know, those sorts of things just to constantly change the environment and, and constantly challenge. Um, we've done things in the past which sound a bit, uh, I don't know, maybe over the top, but give them um, tactical questions while they're running. Uh, you know, give them mathematics questions that they have to answer while you know in between sets of running, just to keep challenging their their mind while they're while they're working. I had to look most of them up, of course. Um, yeah, cool. But, but uh, yeah, fantastic. And what are some other for the developing footballers listening in? Um, what are some other key areas of, of focus for for a developing footballer? I know it's a broad question, but um, what are some key takeaways that you think yeah, are important um, for, for young footballs? I, I think the two most important things are um, resilience and skill, and not necessarily in that order. Um, so if, if we're talking develop, developing AFL footballers, um, skill is king. It always will be, no matter what um, people like me say, um, your ability to kick um, in particular and to, to work below your knees will always be king. So... Um, uh, yeah, that I, I have to say that, and that's that's the absolute truth. Um, but developing your body to be resilient to the demands of the sport is um, absolutely crucial. And everybody probably who's listening into this knows people who uh, haven't made it because they've been injured or have been a bit lazy or uh, those sorts of things. And um, uh, yeah, so develop that resilience in your body, and that's both um, strength and and uh, to a lesser extent. Um, aerobic capacity, but just your ability to repeat efforts um, on multiple days a week is just massive. And for the young footballers that you see coming in, like the first year players, both at Port and Melbourne, um, are there common trends that you see that are like gaps in their physical side um, that need to be topped up pretty quickly? Yeah, I think the biggest gap that I've seen in the last two years since I've been back is the nutritional awareness. I think that's that's 
the impact that nutrition can have on performance is, uh, is as we know, is massive. And I, I think they're just a bit naive with that. And um, that that would be the biggest thing that I've noticed since coming back from the UK is is the players take a little bit of time to to get into um, into good habits in that space. Okay. And what would be some of the the examples of is it changing breakfast or is it eating more vegetables or be some common yeah it could be really simple things like um uh, but uh, like fruit and vegetables but it's more in the periodization of your of your food so um you know during heavy loading weeks you can eat a little bit more um but during light weeks excuse me most players particularly young players will consume the same amount and i think that's that's an issue because you know you end up consuming too many calories and um, so it's not a very technical area. It's often not a very sexy area, um, but it can have a huge impact on your performance. Um, uh, I think uh, the other thing that I would work on is, um, you know, I've got a, a, a 10-year-old boy and if uh, he decides that he wants or, or my, my nine-year-old daughter, if they decide that they want to play sport and go after it, then uh, mobility would be another area that I would really um try and focus them on it sort of from age sort of 14, 15, once they're getting the, to the end of their peak height velocity and their, their peak maturation, um, I'd be really working hard on that because that's just so key for resilience and injury prevention. Okay, and, and what drills would be your go-to for, for improving their mobility? Yeah, I think it, it's trying to put them in as many different um, uh, unpredictable environments as possible. There's sort of two aspects of mobility for me. There's the the in-game mobility where you can just escape a situation. It's no secret that uh, I'll use South American soccer players can just see two or three people around them, the good one, and just find a solution to get out of it because they've been playing street football and futsal uh, growing up. So they just have the lateral movement. It's not done through gym. It's not done through personal trainers it's done through just repeat exposure to many different situations um, and then there's the mobility that you can do when you're away from the sport and that's um, that's where um, uh, people like you or me can help them um, with uh, a lot of flexibility type exercises dynamic movements um, making sure that um, they're you know, things like eldoa poses and, and yoga pilates those sorts of things that a little less than the static stretches that I used to do, you know, just leg on the fence, those sorts of things. Uh, I'm talking about some real movement-based flexibility that I think can have a massive impact, and, and I certainly neglected that in the early part of my professional career. My playing career, I was never good enough to need it, but um, uh, professional career for sure. And um, well, on the on the note that you said that lateral ability and ability to get out of um, awkward situations so the, the, the small side of games is something that you're famous for, um, but, and you, it sounds like you got from that early role with, with Parramatta was something where you sure. developed that skill set. Um, how did how did it go when you implemented that into AFL footy? Yeah, it's something we did early days, then. pretty early yeah. with with Port Adelaide that that maybe wasn't been doing wasn't being used much, and I, I literally stole it straight from soccer. Um, the the question that was asked heavily and is still being asked um, is, oh, but it doesn't look like exactly like footy. Like we don't want to necessarily put that handball over the top or we don't want to necessarily have our players do that movement or that movement. Um, but what I've found is um, without question, um, the different versions of small sided games that you can implement into footy um, just help players get out of traffic so easily, in my opinion. Um, and there's a, I know a couple of soccer players um, on this call and people who work overseas on this call, the agility and lateral movement of even average league soccer players um, is so much better um, and sharper than some of the best AFL players because we're so used to working in straight lines in AFL and sometimes we're a bit scared of the lateral movement because of the, you know, the pubic overload and things like that. But if you get players young enough and condition them mm. for it, um, then it is... It will just pay you back in spades once you get to more competitive, intense situations because you just have the the uh, resources at your disposal in the in the way of strong hips, strong core to get out of situations. So, um, again, if I'm working with young people, um, it's repeat exposure to those scenarios, both 
uh, on and off the pitch. The field, I should say, yeah. pitch is soccer term field, AFL. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. Like, um, the, it seems to be a trend amongst this chat that I'm having with you here that, you know, we rather than saying in our lane and being that specialist sort of view, looking at what's what's the most important thing and if you can replicate the game um, and get that at an earlier age, like would you say playing a small side of game at an early age and getting conditioned to do a volume of that, like the street ball with the kids in soccer, is, you know, better than well, not bench reduction in Copenhagen's and, and Nordics and stuff obviously have their place, but if you can be doing building that resilience, as you mentioned earlier, uh, that will set you up for a longer career in handling those loads oh, more no than doubt. you can do in the gym. Yeah, yeah one thing I learnt the Socceroos through to the time at Liverpool was when you came up against South American players, they just were incredibly thick and uh, between sort of their belly button and the top of their kneecaps, they were just, uh, and they'd never done gym. Like we recruited some players, some really famous, you know, great players at Liverpool. We'd never seen them, but just were stockier than your stockiest AFL player um, who'd, who'd grown up in a sort of gym-centric centric environment. So uh, there's more than one way to get that um, that strength through your hips and, and core. And um, again, if I had a, under 16 team, if you know Tasmania came into the AFL and they started at 16 years old, then that's what I would be targeting really early on. And you might get a few injuries early, but over time, they would develop that robustness and that ability to um, to move laterally and get out of situations for sure. It's something that pops up for mind for you know while the AFLW space is developing with a lot of ACL injuries. Yes. Yep. Great um, point. Could be something sure. that would be implemented to help prevent um, yeah, prevalence. But uh, okay, so that's that's a couple of really good takeaways for, for, for kids, particularly play more footy if you want to. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And play different yeah. sports too. Um, you know, there's a study I tweeted. I haven't been on Twitter much in the last little bit, but I put out a study, uh, retweeted a study yesterday, the day before, that, um, you know, just shows time and time again that talented kids. Um, don't always grow to be talented adults in that sport. Mm. So mix the sport up a bit, you know, mix the movement. That's where, you know, people like yourself and 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 other great um, people, practitioners in this space can really get an edge uh, and do get an edge. Um, uh, and that's by exposing kids, even though parents or coaches or in some, in some cases agents want them to be good at footy. Yep, that's fine. But go and play a few other sports while you're there. Yeah, the um, going back to the mindset element. So some of these um, gun players that you've worked with, both in soccer and football, um, are they a common physical or more mental um, trend that you've seen amongst those players? Like when you meet a player, interview a player for the first time, you can tell oh they've got something. Yeah, uh, on the pitch, their training intensity repeatedly is always a standout. There are. I can't think of anybody that I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, maybe one a uh, famous German player from Arsenal who um, who probably didn't always like constant training intensity, and he's he's absolutely world class. Um, but every other player had the training intensity, um, so the leap from training to game wasn't it wasn't as big as what it is for others. Um, in terms of when you meet them, it's that um, uh, two things. It's the curiosity to learn more um, and to ask a lot of questions about their own performance and their own game, not necessarily the team did poorly here, um, it, whatever. Um, so that curiosity. And then there's that that inner drive. So um, it's... Uh, do you know what, what you should do is you should um, maybe try some cryotherapy or you should try some float tank work or you should try some breathing exercise. Okay, where do I go? What, what do I need to do? Rather than um, maybe you should try some float tank. Yeah, but that's on the other side of town. That's 30 bucks. And yeah, so uh, is there anything else? That, that's the differentiators um, there. Um, the, those ones that just have that inner drive and, you know, Nothing's too difficult. Uh, there's one, one of our players, I was in the gym this morning before 7 o'clock and two of our Melbourne Demons guys, um, you know, our most 
you know, well respected and best players uh, were in from 7 a.m. till 7:45, just working on touch by themselves with you know, with one of the assistant coaches from 7 till 7:45 in the morning, um, uh, and just working on touch, and uh, that's just outstanding from them, and that's why they're at the top of their game. And of those three, like the intensity on the pitch and, and curiosity and in the, in the inner drive, in your experience, how much of it is trainable? Like how much can you change? Yeah, it's a million-dollar question. I think, uh, I think the curiosity can come a bit later. Um, initially, it might not be there because you're just young and do whatever you're told. Um, so that can come. The intensity on the pitch can come, but the inner drive is probably developed through early childhood through whatever parents, genetics, um, can be trauma in childhood, um, you know, those sorts of things give that inner drive. It's pretty hard to implant that someone. That's just my opinion. And it, so for, for those that want to improve their intensity to match their match intensity, what would be an example of a chat that you'd have with a player to, to do that? Um, uh, I guess from uh, I, I use objective information. Um, as much as I can. And in the early days, that was video. So there might be a, uh, in footy, it might be a turnover and you're just jogging back um, and you just show that to the players and you might show them. And I've recorded stuff from TV. So in the in the early days when I was with the Swans and, you know, West Coast were pretty successful. And then when I was with Port and, um, you know, Hawthorne were pretty successful, um, you would often show them, the clips of the good players, and this is what they do, um, both defensive and offensive. Um, nowadays, I can use GPS and I can show them, okay, uh, to use Melbourne Demons, Ed Langdon does. This is why he's um, so incredible and just turns up in, in defensive 50 all the time to help out our defenders. Um, and I can just show them the, the GPS trace um, and GPS numbers for someone like him. And, and we post them all so the players all know um, so, it, you know, there's no hiding now. So, yeah, in terms of training intensity, uh, the players get all that information so they know if they're close to matching. To, we rank them so they know where they sit. Mm -hmm. and, and with the curiosity side of things, is that something that you present on in a large group? Is it just things you sort of drip feed books to players? How do you go about developing yeah. players' curiosity? Uh, I've done um, all of the above, um, but... Uh, I, I really like um, just sending them links to podcasts or articles or websites and just say, just check this out. And I've got 43 players um, at the D's and if we get 20 reading it, clicking on it, which is probably about what we get, you know, you, you would think it's somewhere around 50%, um, hopefully more, then that's a win. Uh, if I got four doing it, I'd still do it um, because it's it's worthwhile um, and uh, if it can facilitate that sort of curiosity, um, it's great. And fortunately for me, I, I work with some amazing staff. So between all of us, um, we're constantly sort of saying to the players, did, did you read that? Did you see that article that, um, that Marcus Bontempelli does this? Uh, maybe we could try that. Or that, you know, player B um, does this for their recovery. Maybe we should try that. Yeah, throughout our whole club, we're, we're trying to facilitate that as much as possible. Yep. Well, I've got, I'll hand over a couple of questions from the guys that have been watching. Um, this one's from an a S and C. Uh, how can I be more desirable S and C coach after I graduate? They're in their final year. I reckon you might answer this uh, earlier. Yeah, what we were talking about earlier. In, yeah. yeah, yeah, coaching your own team. Um, uh, I'm interviewing at the moment for for a position within the club, and um, it's a it's a PhD position, so academic component, but. We what I looked for in the many applicants that we got was who's coached, who's coached their own team. And we had one who made the final three who's coached a high school team, and that's absolutely fine. Yeah, coach your own team as well as getting the qualifications. Yep. This one, who's the most genetically gifted athlete you have coached? Uh, I would say Gavin Wanganeen, um in the... Uh, old days he just did th things with so little training that um yeah i've not seen before um from a, a strength power endurance mobility skill point of view he was just a freak in the soccer world the most genetically gifted from an athletics point of view was fernando Torres. he's running stop 
I was just magnificent to watch from a playing ability point of view, probably Mesut Ozil. He was just great to watch train. He just Who did things on the field that, that I've not seen. Mesut Ozil um, from, uh, Ozil, from yeah, Arsenal. Yeah. He was just, yeah, just incredible to watch. This one is from a football player. What exercises should be good to do a day before a game? Stretching, activation, weights. It's a bit of a yeah, pre-game routine. Yeah, so day before a game, I, I like players to actually get out and move and move fast. Um, so, um, you know, the day before any sort of game uh, to get some intensity. Um, and I think that's more neurally than... Than, than physically, I guess, um, or structurally, I should say. Um, so uh, include some sprint work, include some plyometric sort of bounding work. If you are doing gym work, make it fast movements um, just to almost wake the body up and let the body know, hey, we're going into battle tomorrow. So um, certainly whatever skill component you feel like you need to work on. Um, for me, it's about making players feel good, not necessarily a lot of tactics, um, short, sharp session with speed and, and power. Okay, so would would you encourage that in the captain's run at, at Melbourne? Does it, yes, is there, for sure. There's high, some in high intensity, yeah. We do, yeah, we do. Uh, it's only sort of 25 minutes and and two of those drills are, are super quick and I include some, some fun game sprint stuff in the warm-up um, uh, with a bit of competition. And then this one on the flip side, the recovery so I think what recovery techniques do you believe are best for in-season performance? Um, I think uh, there there is there's some decent research, um, but there's a whole lot more anecdotal research about uh, movement through salt water. Um, so uh, I know it's hard in Melbourne, um, but getting into the beach uh, the day after a game and moving around, there's you know, some, like I said, good research about the sort of hydrostatic pressure that that creates rather than just sitting in an ice bath and I always tell my players when I was working with the Swans and and Port Adelaide, we used to laugh at um, the pictures that you would see on Fox Footy of players standing shin deep um, with jackets on and beanies on, um, you know, at St Kilda Baths. There is some benefit in that, but it is far more beneficial to be moving around and to be fully uh, submerged, um, even just briefly. Um, so I know it's hard, but for 10 minutes after a game, I really like that. Uh, other recovery techniques, uh, I really like things like float tanks, um, anything that can just put you in a, um, a reduced stimulus environment, I think is, is fantastic. Um, and then it's whatever you believe works. So uh, ice baths are good, but uh, some players don't believe in it and find them really stressful, so we don't force that on them. Saunas have become becoming really, really popular. I quite like those. Um, there's some good research around them as well as being quite a pleasant experience. So, yeah, there's a range there. But get in the beach. Yep, yep. Easy, yeah. It's free. Get in the beach. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time, mate. We'll wrap it up with um, what are you most excited for, for for 2021? What's on the horizon for you, Darren? Uh, well, the D's are seven and O at the moment, so I'm pretty excited by that. And and yeah, I've been uh, lucky enough to work with some um, some teams uh, overseas and things like that. But uh, what motivates me is not not who you work for or you know whatever tracksuit. It's seeing young players in particular for me um, sort of achieve what you know their ultimate success. And so uh, this Melbourne group has worked really hard and has been really sort of uh, or I won't say disrespected, but doesn't have the respect of the league um, because of what's happened in the past. And um, uh, so I'm really enjoying seeing them um, get some respect and earn that respect. And um, and there is a super tight group um, from the players, from the staff. It's honestly, it's, it's a pleasure to go into work each day and work with the staff that we've got. Um, so I'm really excited for... Um, for the staff uh, to, to, to keep learning off the people that I'm working with, you know, Selwyn Griffiths, David Regan, Dave Watts, um, Daniel James, Brent Nicholson, Kathleen Skadashian, and, um, you know, all these great people in the club. Beck Alcock, I've got to mention nutritionists because I'm very highly, so yeah, just great people. So long answer, but, um, yeah, I'm really excited by, by uh, the, the rest of the AFL season. Hopefully we'll keep going. I'm sure you will. 
I'm sure you will. Well, thank you very much again, mate. I really appreciate you sharing your time, but also experiences and, and opening up with uh, things that have worked, what didn't work, and um, yeah, really appreciate the, the stories as well. Yeah, no problem, Jack. Congrats on everything that you're doing, mate. It's awesome. I love it. I appreciate it. Well, thanks, Darren. All the best for the rest of the season, mate. Cheers. Thanks, Jack. Cheers, mate. Well, that was fantastic, guys. Thank you for listening. If you missed the start or any part of that, make sure to watch back at the beginning. Uh, I'll post that on my IGTV. Uh, That was a fantastic episode where Darren shared plenty of gems all the way through the last sort of 45 minutes. And make sure if you're not already subscribed to our community by clicking the link in our bio. Uh, From there, you'll get a free strength and conditioning program. And if you want to work with one of our coaches, Uh, you can head over to our website where you can check out our coach's bio and work with us either online or with face-to-face sessions to work on your technique. And of course, please subscribe to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and uh, YouTube. Thanks, guys.